Now in its third year, it's a yank on the footy with Craig Wessels talking about the greatest game on the face of the earth. Sit back and enjoy, everybody. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 217 of A Yank on the Footy. I'm Craig Wessels coming to you from very chilly Sandusky, Ohio, and thanks for giving the episode a listen. In this episode, I'm going to be sitting down with Peter Lausch to discuss another one of my most memorable game series games, and this one takes on a whole new connotation that uh, I really wish we were not uh, having to delve into, but I would be remiss if I didn't. And again, as I'd mentioned, rather chilly here today. I'm looking at my uh, thermometer on my phone right now, and it is uh, about 5.30 in the afternoon, and we are still down at minus 18 Celsius with almost 40 kilometer an hour winds out of the west. To say that it's a little chilly would be an understatement. And for those of you that didn't see on Twitter today, we spent about eight hours with the electricity out at our house and the interior of the house got down to about eight degrees Celsius, which I like to save money and keep my thermostat turned low, but not quite that low. So power's back on. So I'm recording, I'm editing, and we're going to get this thing out to you today. And I'm very excited to share this episode with you. Don't forget that if you are interested in having your local footy club get a shout out during an upcoming episode, Drop me a note via email at yankonthefooty at gmail.com or shoot me a message on Facebook over on Twitter at yank underscore on or find me on Instagram. I love being able to highlight clubs throughout the season. This is just a, a, a labor of love, and I, I really enjoyed learning about these uh, the different games, especially uh, this one that's going to be at the VFA level, which I had not talked to anybody about the VFA previously, so I was enthralled to learn about that as well. Now, and again... What is your most memorable game? If you've uh, seen the recent blog post that I, I put up on my website, yankonthefooty.com, and I guess I say recent, and I put it up there a couple of months ago, and uh, I'm starting to get some, some traction with this, but at the same time, I'm also gearing up for club-by-club -club preview episodes uh, on the podcast as well. But if you've got a, uh, a most memorable game, I would love to sit down and talk with you about that. So reach out to me on one of my socials and let me know. Absolutely love to talk to you about that. Now, today's club of the episode is the Albanvale Cobras, and you'll know why here in just a moment. And the Cobras were founded back in 1978, and they played many years at various grounds around the area before they uh, got their own home ground, uh, which, based upon what I read, uh, was a little dilapidated when they got hold of it, and they've done a yeoman's effort of turning this into a wonderful ground for themselves. They've been there for a little over a decade, and they play at the Robert Bruce Reserve. And the club just released uh, their 2023 fixture, and I did see that they open up round one on April the 15th against Sunshine Heights. And I do want to wish the Cobras the absolute best in 2023 and love their club logo, the snake. I really think that's a sharp-looking logo. Uh, I coached a baseball team called the Vipers many years ago, and uh, we had a logo that was somewhat similar to that, but this one's a really sharp-looking logo. So let's go ahead and jump into my chat with Peter Lausch, and uh, Peter reached out to me um, about doing a Most Memorable Game episode, and I actually had contacted him as well back in September, as we're going to talk about at the outset here. Uh, because he posted something on social media that I thought was rather provocative in terms of uh, stuff that he was hoping to get accomplished, and we'll get into that early on in this. But uh, before we dive in, I, uh, I, I would be remiss, and Peter and I sat down earlier this week, and I'm recording this on the 23rd of December right now, but Peter and I sat down, I believe, three days ago, but I would be remiss, as, as I was saying there, if I did not pay my respects to Barry Round, uh, Peter sent me a note uh, letting me know that uh, Mr. Round passed away earlier today. Uh, as I said, you'll, as you soon hear, the episode references uh, this wonderful man, this terrific Ruckman. Uh, and we're going to be talking about the 1990 VFA premiership between Springvale and Williamstown. And Mr. Round played well over 100 games with Footscray, with Sydney, and with Williamstown after he left the AFL. He also coached the Seagulls between 18, 1989 and 1993, including the game we're going to be talking about today. He actually won the Norm Goss medal for the best player on ground for that game. and was the 1981 Brownlow medalist 
during his time with Sydney. And I tip my cap, Valet Barry Round. Valet, sir, my condolences to your family and friends. And I want to thank Peter for suggesting this game and chatting about this one because I learned a lot about the VFA because it was something I wasn't previously all that aware of. And I, as I've said many times, I love learning about the different aspects and the different facets of the greatest game on the planet. So, Peter, thank you very much. So let's go ahead and dive into my uh, talk with Peter. I hope you enjoy it. My guest this episode, ladies and gentlemen, is a great footy fan who is getting ready to head out on a, uh, a footy adventure here in the coming weeks. I reached out to him back in September, uh, shortly after the grand final, if I'm not mistaken, after I saw a social media post that he had uh, put out on Facebook uh, about his what he called his footy bucket list for 2023. And we're going to be talking about that, but we're also going to be talking about his most memorable game. And I'm excited to talk about this one because one, it's gonna it's gonna help to uh, get me uh, the opportunity to learn a little bit more about the structure of the game away from the AFL VFL uh, and how the game changed a little bit in Victoria. And I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome Peter Lausch to the podcast. Peter, thanks for coming on, man. Thank you for having us, Craig. It's um, very excited. Um, to be on your podcast and also speaking to somebody overseas about Australian rules football because we both have the common love of the game. Oh, it's well, I yours yours is you know yours is one that you had a lifetime of, and I'm I'm trying to play catch up. Okay, that's I mean I <laughs> I'm tr- I'm trying to I'm trying to get to where I you know where I, I recognize you know old photos of people and I go I I know who that person is I know who that player is and it's I'm, <laughs> I get a few I get a few every once in a while so. Yeah, but, you know, I, I reached out to you on, on Facebook, I think it was towards the end of September, about your uh, your footy bucket list. And I want to talk about that first before we get into your most memorable game. But I want to I want to ask you, I, I do you do you worry about the term bucket list? Because, I mean, the uh, bucket list has a connotation, which is, you know, it's it's kind of like the, this is the last hurrah, that sort of thing. And I and I and I'm, I'm hoping that this is something that you also have then a quote unquote footy bucket list for 2024 as well so should we maybe call this a to-do list rather than a bucket list yeah i think that that might be a little bit fair because i'm only 47 years of age so i think i've still got another 30 or 35 years of contribution to the great game i i hope a lot longer than that but yes i i i I get the idea of the concept of the bucket list but it just seems like such there's such a finality to that like okay you're not doing anything else after this and i and i hope that's not the case so let's let's hope we've got you know, another generation of t- or two of being able to, you know, influence the game and enjoying the game and, and getting out there and, and seeing all of that. And uh, I know you mentioned to me is off air before we started recording here and you're, you're wearing a, a Darwin Buffalo's cap and you've got a, the, uh, the league uh, polo shirt on as well. Uh, the Northern Territories AFL shirt on. Tell us why you have that on. So what's, what do you got going on? Okay, I'm actually a Waratah supporter up in Darwin, but I've got a soft spot for the Darwin Buffs because um, their former president, Sean Pierce, who just handed over the reins earlier this year to Brenda Atkinson, was my president at the Oakley Youth Football Club 30 years ago. And we um, caught up after 30 years in March this year. So that was a bit of a surprise. It just shows you how small the football world is bumping into somebody 3,700 kilometers away from home I don't know what that is in miles Um, and um, yeah um, so I've got a bit of a soft spot plus I've got a good working relationship with their women's coach Melinda Taylor Harris and we're hoping that at least three of the Darwin Buffets that's what the women's side is called um, get a spot on a VFLW list and also play local football at um Spotswood Football Club in the Western Region Football League here in Melbourne. We're also hoping that we can get one of the Waratah girls and one of the Pints girls to also secure a spot on the VFLW list and play at spots we're not required at VFLW level. Um, Northern Territory football, it's a little bit different to um, the rest of Australia. It's played in our summer, which is right now, um, from October to March. Everywhere else in Australia, cricket is played. The reason being is the wet season up in Darwin. You get monsoonal rains, 34 degrees, which is you can do the conversion in Fahrenheit. It's about, it's about uh, 100 degrees. It's about 100 Fahrenheit. Yeah. 
Yeah, so yep. about 100 Fahrenheit. Um, you sort of uh, 80% humidity, 90% humidity. Luckily, the majority of the grounds now have got light towers. So playing football in the middle of the day doesn't happen that often anymore. So the um, heat stroke factor doesn't play a big part. And it's just unique to go up there, and um, it's one of those, it's one of those places, Darwin, um, a very small place, half the size of Geelong. Mm-hmm. Um, Geelong's got about four hundred thousand people. Darwin's probably got about one hundred and seventy-five thousand people that live there permanently. Um, it's a very transient um, sort of capital, the north, the most northern capital of Australia, and um, yeah, it's just one of those places. If you go there once. You're either going to like it or you're going to hate it. And it just, it's got me. I could easily live up there for four to six months of the year just because it's a lot quieter than Melbourne and the football's played at a different part of the year. Okay. Well, I mean, it sounds, it sounds like, you know, it's, and, and I, and I've, I've, I've learned this, you know, here in the, here in the U S you know, people, when they t- retire, they tend to move South to go to the warmer weather, but in Australia, people go North to get to the warmer weather in the winter time, you know, because I, I've I've been hearing and seeing a lot on on social media that 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 uh, that summer has uh, has not exactly been sprinting towards Melbourne this year. It, it's it's kind of still on vacation because you've still been dealing with some rather chilly weather there. Yeah, no, it's um current currently it's um raining outside, so it's, we had. 32 degrees, which is probably 90, 90 Fahrenheit yesterday. Well, you've up, it's up in the 30s now? Okay. Yeah, we got into the 30s yesterday. Oh, just We struggled in. But, um, yeah, it was um, a battle to get there. And last night, uh, driving home from work for the last time in 2022, you could see the very overcast weather. And sure enough, overnight it started raining and it's still raining this morning. It's um, 10.02 local time so here in Melbourne. So mm-hmm. I'm not expecting the sun to come out until about 5, 6 p.m. And then when it does come out, it'll disappear pretty quickly. So you're, you're heading up to, to Darwin now. Are you going to be involved with the organization of trying to bring some of these players down to the uh to the vflw and to spotswood and that sort of thing yeah well we we were already in the process of okay. um, talking to five girls i don't want to reveal the vflw club because obviously we want to try to get them signed before we get them but they'll all go to the same club so okay um and one of the champion former players and captains of the men's side in the 90s is doing the talking now with the club and all okay. the clubs and the coaches and the players. Um, and uh, the deal is that, um, especially with the Buffets, because they're playing some really good football, that they get to stay up there until their season is complete, whether that's in the home and away season or the finals. So they'll, okay. they'll join this club very, very late. Okay. And... Um, you know, just to give them that at home feel, Spotswood will be the um, local club that will align them all to because we find that we, you know, when you come from a long way from home, away from family and friends, if you have four or five others from the Northern Territory, generally that actually works pretty well, especially with female footballers. They don't get as homesick as the male footballers I've noticed over the years when I've done, done sort of chats about possibilities playing in Melbourne. Like earlier this year, I had a... Uh, um, a Tiwi Bomber player come down to the Sunbury Kangaroos Football Club and he sort of only lasted six weeks before he had to go home and um, never never returned. It's just the homesickness. With with the girls, it's a lot easier. And he, if you especially bring them down in groups of, say, two, twos and threes and they live together, they okay. play footy together and they either study or work together, um, generally homesickness doesn't kick in and... If you're very, very lucky, you'll get, say, three, four, five seasons out of them coming coming south. And some of them okay. love Melbourne so much um, that they, well, they tend to stay. <laughs> well, and, 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 and you know, I, and I, and I've read a little bit about Darwin and I've, I've looked online quite a bit about Darwin and it's, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a metropolis. It's a good sized city, but, yep. but, you know, I would, I would imagine, you know, that, that, you, you know, whether it's Brisbane or Canberra or Sydney or, Perth or Melbourne, that those are that those are areas where people are often gravitating towards in terms of maybe long term employment and that sort of thing as well. Yep. Um, so it, it kind of makes sense that that you know that that once somebody gets there, that they might find that that's a, a palatable place for them to to spend you know their career playing footy and then hopefully having that 
evolve into you know uh, if it does if Cody doesn't work out in terms of being able to set themselves up a little bit that they get the connections you know financially or you know employment wise to, to help them to make a career for themselves. Yeah, no, that's that, that is right. Like that's one thing where in Darwin, um, you've got to be a very skilled person with employment, what employment wise, um, to live there sort of permanently, mm -hmm. or if you want to move up in in the um sort of profession, what you're doing, um, mostly there's a lot of labouring jobs up there, a lot of building going on. Um, there's a bit of uh, work about a decade ago with the Timor gas lines and all that. And a lot of players that came up from South would get work there um, whilst they were playing football up in Darwin. And, um, but yeah, it's definitely one of why, you know, I can see when somebody leaves the Northern Territory and they get employment after their football career South, they generally stay South. Um, hopefully that will change in years to come if they do, um, put a um, Northern Territory football team, an AFL team in there, but I think that's on the on the back burner right now because I think Tasmania is the priority. Right, right. So you so you're somebody who thinks that 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 the possibility or the prospects of having a a an AFL club in you know in the AFL season in Darwin is a possibility because Yeah. You know, I, I, I honestly believe Go ahead. Yeah, no, I honestly believe they can do that. They're talking about building a um, stadium in the middle of the um, city, which includes a roof and all that. And um, you've got to remember in the winter up there, even though it's warm, the humidity factor is a lot more bearable as well. So um, they've had the NT Thunder in the Northeast Australian Football League in previous years play up at TIO Stadium in the winter season um and that that's been night games and that's been that that worked unfortunately um the nt thunder and the knee competition folded in the end of 2019 and um some of the teams disappeared the nt thunder unfortunately was one of those sides but okay um some of the other sides got absorbed back into the queensland australian football league and others like southport were fortunate enough to join the vfl because they were such a powerful side um but yeah no it's um it is possible and if they build build a stadium in the heart heart of darwin and they've got the land there um I can see uh, AFL side being a successful side and we'll see a lot of the Indigenous kids, especially their careers extended by staying at home. Right, right. Yeah, because somebody, yeah, I remember, and I remember talking with someone about this issue and I, I don't remember specifically who I spoke with, but, and I'm actually just pulling up uh, uh, Australia on Google Earth right now um, because I wanted to just remind myself of, of locations here, but I, I've, I've had, I think the person that I spoke with, um, we, we talked about, you know, what would the possibility of, you know, maybe, you know, that, that maybe if, 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 uh, and Darwin may very well be able to be, you know, support a club as a standalone club on its own, but this person and I, we talked about, you know, maybe this being a club that, you know, that would play, you know, you know, maybe, 40% of their games in Darwin and then kind of split the other 60% between like Cairns and Townsville, that sort of thing, you know, to, to, you know, because you've got other, you know, large metropolitan areas that, that would be screaming for football and it would, it would be very similar to what uh, North Melbourne and Hawthorne have done playing in Tasmania. Yeah, and GWS playing in Canberra. Yeah. Right. Uh, right. It is, yeah. It is a, it is a possibility, but I, <clears throat> If you ask Tasmanians, they will tell you that they would prefer their own Tasmanian AFL side. Absolutely makes and, sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so would so would um, I dare say the Northern Territory people. And the logical place to place that would probably be in Darwin, even though you probably could play two or three games down at Traeger Park at Alice Springs, because mm -hmm. they've got an AFL ground where I think the Melbourne Footy Club played a couple of games at Traeger Park, but Port Adelaide have played at Traeger Park in Alice Springs as well, so you could share share the games between Darwin and Alice Springs. I think they did um, last year. They did last year, I think, did they not? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think Melbourne played a couple of games up there, and I think Port Adelaide has been there previous years. And okay. um, Darwin's trying to build an academy now with the Gold Coast Suns, so there's a little bit of a, a link there. However, talking to some of the younger players and saying to them, oh, 
if you had a choice between playing AFL football in Melbourne or on the Gold Coast, where would you like to play? The majority will say, oh, I barrack for Collingwood or I barrack for Carlton, I barrack for Essendon. Obviously, I'd like to be in the heartland of the AFL football if I could. Right. But if the Gold Coast draft me, obviously, I won't say no to that because right. it's a, a chance to play. But some of the kids that are in the Gold Coast Academy, if you actually ask them um, off air, they'll probably tell you um, they would prefer to see if they can get to a Melbourne club. But, you know, and, and I think that's pro- that, that makes a lot of sense. But I think also we've seen... You know, where you've, you've begun to see, you know, Gold Coast finally be able to sign, begin to sign some of their, their younger players to um, to, ex- to contract extensions. Yeah, I think Matty Rowell yeah. did, uh, King did just recently as well. I mean, yeah. and I, and, Miller. Yeah, Tuke Miller did as well. Yeah. And I mean, I, I'd love to have Tuke Miller playing on my side. And it's, yeah. it's I, you know, and, and I think in many ways, it's, it, you know, Gold Coast. Yes, it's not a hotbed of footy, but it's also it's it's a location where you also get to have you know you know maybe a little bit more anonymity as you ply yep. your craft. There's maybe a little less pressure on you to become you know. And again, I'm yeah. I've 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 already put it out on there. I think that Gold Coast has a strong chance of making the eight this year. I really think if yeah. if I think that's a club that that. Definitely, if, if King is healthy this year, I think that's a club that makes the push into the eight this year. Uh, I don't know at whose expense. I don't want to don't want to say quite yet, uh, but because I'm still working through that. But uh, I think they're on the precipice of being there. Uh, I think I think the secret with those East Coast footy clubs like Sydney Swans, GWS, mm-hmm. Brisbane Lions, and Gold Coast is they they need long term success like. When the Lions won their three premierships in the row and played in four grand finals in the row in the early 2000s, um, it was hard to get hard to walk up to the Gabba and buy a ticket to watch them. You had to right, be a member. Right. And a lot of those clubs, including the Swans, are a great example. They cannot afford to hit rock bottom. If they sort of go through a rebuilding patch, the best they can do is go middle of the ladder, maybe miss the finals for one or two years, and then go back in. Those um, places like Sydney, Brisbane, and Gold Coast are very um, success-driven areas. So, if the Gold Coast were to become a, a Brisbane Lions of the early two thousands, mm-hmm. you watch you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to walk up to Metricon Stadium on a Saturday night, say even if they were playing Fremantle, and buy a ticket. You'd have to be a member there. And, and you know what? I I hope we see that happen. I, I mean, and, and again, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a Gold Coast apologist, you know, and, and I, I've had this discussion with a lot of people that a lot of folks, you know, kind of, you know, they, they unofficially list Gold Coast as their second club, you know, that they, that they want to see, they want to see the little stepbrother be successful finally, you know, oh, he's had a lot of troubles. Let, let's hope something good happens to him, that sort of thing. And I, and they're, that's a fun club to watch. I mean, I, I enjoy watching. I'm, I'm glad to see that, you know, that Stuart Dew was able to keep his, his position to continue to build what they, what they've got there, you know. I just you know I think losing King to that knee injury, you know, did them no help this year. But you know, it, Levi Casbolt stepped in and 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 did a, a nice job for them this year. So I think having the two of them together, you know, uh, I, I I I will you know full disclosure as a Cat supporter, I, I'm very glad that they were you know thrilled to part with the seventh pick of the draft. I, I'll I'll admit that. Uh, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> But you know, it's it, we we had that happen. You know, I'm, I I support the Cleveland Browns in, in the NFL, and we had that happen a few years ago, where the we had there was a, a the team in Houston wanted to get rid of a player, and you know they wanted to get rid of his expensive contract. So the Browns said, "Well, we'll take his contract, give us a second round pick, and we'll give you back a fourth round pick." So they actually moved up. You know, they got they moved up like sixty spots in the draft, and and said, "Well, we have extra money lying around. We're not using right now. We'll take him for a year, then we'll get rid of him. We're going to get better pick out of it." Of course, I think they wasted the pick because the guy that they drafted, I don't think, is still playing anymore. But they had that opportunity though. So you you you're, you're involved with the uh, you know heading up to the Northern Territories. Um, looks like you're also trying to you know head over to South Australia to try to get to some games in the Sandville as well, or in the Sandville as well. 
yeah, I'm hoping to get across there because I've been to Adelaide for a, a fair few years, obviously with COVID restrictions mm -hmm. in prior years, and um, just well, you, being you, you barely yeah. got across the street during COVID over the last couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, times it was a little bit tough, you know. So I was lucky enough to be able to get a work permit to travel around more than five kilometres um, from home. So I was pretty lucky in that sense, but um. Yeah, no, I wouldn't mind getting across to South Australia and Tasmania and watching a bit of their sort of state league football because it's, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I have seen South Australian teams previously play against the NTFL rep teams in, in the last couple of years. Um, that includes Woodville West Torrens and Glenelg Footy Club. This year they're playing against the Western Australian teams. They're playing against the men's are playing against South Fremantle, which are the Bulldogs, and they, they won the premiership. And the girls are playing against Claremont Tigers. That's the women's premiers in Western Australia. What they okay. did in previous years is they just grabbed the men's premier premiers team and then grabbed the women's team from South Australia. And unfortunately, the Northern Territory girls, as a spectacle, the game wasn't great to watch because the Northern Territory girls won by about 15 goals. Wow. Now that they've grabbed the premiers from the WAFL, we, I'm expecting that both games are going to be really good quality games, really close games to watch. So, but yeah, the plan needs to get across to South Australia. I like Adelaide as a city. It's a nice, quiet city. It's easy to drive around. Good quality football. Crazy football fans like myself. Mm -hmm. And Tasmania is very much similar to that. You know, a little, little bit smaller. And um, hopefully, definitely South Australia looks like it'll be on the list. Tasmania, if I can squeeze it in somewhere, because I also do v VFL commentary on 3WBC radio here. Okay. Special comments, and that's uh, usually for Box Hill Hawks games. Um, yeah, if I can squeeze it in on a weekend when the Box Hill Hawks have got a, a buy, I'll... Um, drive across to South Australia with a friend and with Tasmania might be a case of flying across and hiring a car. So you don't have much going on at all with footy is what you're really trying to tell me. You're not involved with the game at all. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's... No, <laughs> Every year it gets busier and busier. So, you know, I, if you told me a year ago that I would be a um, under 12s premiership assistant coach, mm -hmm. I would have laughed at you, but, um, an opportunity arose. I had a good friend um, who was coaching the Auburn Vale Cobras, and surprisingly, none of the fathers or mothers wanted to be assistant coaches. They were happy to be water carriers. They were happy to be runners. They were happy to be goal umpires and umpire escorts, but they didn't want to be an assistant coach. And about three weeks into the season, I got involved in coaching, and uh, what a time to get involved, become a premiership assistant coach at the end of the year as well. And that's where I've got my bucket list from as well when we talk about that later on. Right, right. It's his bucket it's his bucket list that I'm helping him complete because he's a he's a little bit older than myself and he's thinking mm -hmm. about retiring from okay. coaching in the next couple of years. So I guess and I, I guess I've never really asked this and I've spoken to a couple of people who are involved in like the local clubs. I mean somebody like with Albury, you know, up there around you know, up around right around the border there. But I guess I've never talked yep. to anybody who's involved in like the the youth competition. Do the the games that like the, the twelve and under groups play. What what day of the week do they typically play those games? Okay, in the Western Region Football League, the under twelves usually play Sunday morning at nine fifty a.m. So nice and early. So okay. If you like if you like your sleep in on Sundays, um, forget about coaching under twelves. Okay. And in the finals, they even made us play at about eight thirty one game. Okay. Because obviously with finals they've got to. They've got the two ovals, but they've got about 15, 20 games of various age groups to get okay. through. But, yeah, 9.50 Sunday morning is generally when the under-12s play. I was I was wondering mainly because with you know, with your other commitments to doing you know, special commentary on the games and that sort of thing, I didn't know how, you know, how, you know, how much time did you have to get from, hey, guys, great game, I got to go, you know, and you got to hop in the car and, you know, get a, get across town to where you're you're announcing it. I didn't know what kind of time frame you would have with that and how, how hectic that was going to be for you. Luckily, that only happened once, okay. and um, I only and it was a, unfortunately it was um, the VFL didn't do me any favors that that week. They actually moved the game an hour earlier than it was originally scheduled, so I missed the first quarter of radio commitments there. But it's only happened the one one time. The okay. other time, it's generally pretty pretty good because um, what I generally do with my VFL radio commitments is I'll do say three or four weeks in a row. 
and then oh. I'll have a week off and let somebody else rotate in. And I'd also do a Monday night show on 3WBC called BFL Rewind, which sort of re- reviews the round that's just been completed. Okay, yeah. I just, I, as I mentioned the off-air, my, my son just arrived home, so he's just downstairs. I was sending him <laughs> sending him a quick text, text message letting him know that, that you and I were talking right now, so... Uh, that's all good. <laughs> terrific. Yeah, I'm glad glad that he's home. My daughter's driving home tomorrow, and we have a uh, tomorrow on Thursday. She's driving home, and we have uh, blizzard conditions that are going to be hitting us on Friday and Saturday this weekend. So nobody's going to be on the road on those two days because you're not going to get more than yeah. you might be able to walk a couple miles from house, but the house, but your car is not going to get a couple miles from the house. We're going to be we're going to be stuck at home. Or at home, stuck at home makes it gives a negative connotation there. So yeah, I it's it's really neat to to see that you're involved in so many different levels and, and that you're you know you're working alongside people who are trying to you know expand opportunities for um, for people coming down from the northern territories to you know to come play in the in the VFLW and of course you know those those VFLW opportunities could possibly lead you know possibly lead to maybe getting a spot with one of the 18 clubs in the AFLW at some point in time, depending upon how, how well they perform. You, you never know. Um, yeah. But, you know, but it's, 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 it's really great to, 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 to see that you are involved in so many things. And you're, you know, you're kind of, you mentioned somebody else that, uh, that, that we both know you mentioned, uh, and I'll just go ahead and say it here. Hello, Michael, uh, Michael Gallus. Uh, you know, uh, I, I've called him on the podcast. I have called him a, a footy, a, a, I've called him a Renaissance man because he's involved in so many different things. And I, I don't know if he really liked me using that term, but I, I think it's apt for him. And you're, you're, you're kind of like a footy Renaissance man as well, involved in so many different aspects of things. I'll tell you a funny story about Michael, um, how I met him. I met him last, last year. And as you know, Michael was born in Fiji, lives mm-hmm. in Australia, coaches Pakistan, but he also coached at the Nations Footy Cup last year, which is a tournament here in Melbourne in February. He coached um, the New Zealand girls' side, um, very first New Zealand girls' I didn't side know that. in a tournament. Uh, well, you can um, next time you interview, interview him, you can have a chat to him about that. And I, I was. Um, put in charge as the interim president of Team Lebanon in the men's men's team. And we, <laughs> in the Nations Footy Cup, we have what, the first ever Nations Footy Cup we won. Mm-hmm. And the second one, we lost to the Italians by by a couple of points. But we sort of um, are a rebuilding side because um, the Lebanese uh, team was an older side, but now we're bringing the youth policy. A lot of 16, 17, 18-year-old kids are there. Um Basha Hooli takes a bit of an interest in it. And we've got uh, Ahmed Saad and a few ex AFL boys that are sort of um, interested in the Team Lebanon side and all that. And I was made interim president because years ago, Team Lebanon had a bad reputation that they were a, hit, a side that were known for a bit of thuggery. And um, they decided they needed a new president. So I've sort of become the permanent interim president of Lebanon in the um, Nations Footy Cup as well. so And that's how I <laughs> met Michael last year. Okay. Um, he I was like- involved with um, in the, the New Zealand girls' side. And I think he previously had a role with what, uh, the Lebanon side as well. When, okay. And there was another tournament here in Melbourne. I, I like I like that term, permanent interim. That's uh... a... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We, yeah. Uh, yes. But people always ask me, how the, how, how the hell has a... Um, <laughs> a blonde-headed Aussie bloke become the interim president of Lebanon. And I go, well, Lebanese football's like Lebanese politics. It can get, get, get a bit controversial and fiery. I, yeah. <laughs> well, I've, I've, I've spoken, you know, I've spoken to Michael and especially about the, uh, you know, the recent, you know, the, the AFL Asia championships. And I, and I told him, I've told him flat out, this needs, to, that story needs to be made into a movie. Yeah, that that oh, whole that, I mean, and, and and I told him I said it, it could even go back to, it could even go back to him teaching in Melbourne, and then making yep. the transition up to uh, Nunkamba, and then heading there, then going back to Nunkamba, and just that it could be a film where you know you're also looking at you know at at the sacrifices that the the athletes on this team had to make in order to 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 play in this game, and, yeah. and just and and I wish. I, I wish there was, you know, 
the language barrier is going to preclude me from being able to, to, to talk to most of these people, if not all of them. But I would love to be able to just, you know, to sit down and talk with them about just how difficult it was for them to to actually get this whole thing organized because he had people coming from all over the country. And, and if people haven't listened to that episode, you know, Pakistan land wise is a relatively small country, but in terms of population, yeah. it's massive. It's yeah. a massive I, country population wise. You know, it's, I, was, I saw the photos of Michael had and the traffic congestion mm-hmm. over there and um, three people sitting on one motorbike and all that. But um, no, he, he's a really good um person Michael he promotes the game of Australia oh, rules football wherever he goes and we try we all the people that really are really passionate about it and get involved with these tournaments outside the normal footy season mm-hmm. um, try to promote it across as many cultures as possible like the Nations Footy Cup this year is going to have teams like um, Albania, Italy, Greece, Australia, New Zealand, Samoa. Um, I think there's going to be a South Asia side that's going to be made up of predominantly um, Indian and Sri Lankan players from the Masala Den, the okay. football club here in Melbourne. Um, they're sort of still looking at a South Sudan or Team Africa concept as well. Wow. And the, they'll also be um, they're expanding their women's program as well. I think the women's, women's division is out to five or six teams now. Okay. So um, it's really, really um, the Irish have come on board as well. And um, the Irish girls, um, I think, will be playing as well. So it's um, it's it's something that's well worthwhile getting into. And if you ever happen to be in Melbourne in late February, um, mid mid to late February, um, or hop on Facebook, Nations Footy Cup Mm -hmm. is the Facebook page, and you you can read all about it. And um, they're in the recruiting mode right now. I'm not sure if Mike was involved this year, but he was the original Kiwi coach for the girls. Okay. And I would imagine if he's not involved, he will be again very soon because it's, uh, yeah. he's, he's like, he's like a moth to a flame. He gets, you know, there's yeah. something that needs to be done. He gets, he, he gravitates towards it. And that's, and that is, it's something yeah. that I, I, well, I actually, I have to put my cap on first so I can tip my cap to him. So ooh, I'll, tip, <laughs> I'll tip my cap to him. I, I just, I, I, I have mad respect for that gentleman. He's just, he's, uh, yeah. He just is. He's he's one of the great people on planet Earth. It's, it, oh, it's yeah, 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 a fantastic bloke, Mark. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. So um, there needs to be more of a, of his type around the world that can really push the push the game to all all, all ends of the globe. Right, and and it's and it's not even just footy related. It's just it's just you know a humanity thing as well. I mean, he's yeah. just he's just a, you know it's just an absolute decent human being, decent man. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you got to you got to give it to his wife and his kids. There, considering he spends a lot of time abroad or interstate this year, going from remote Western Australia to Islamabad to Bangkok, back to Melbourne. Yeah. And, well, he went back. To, he went back to WA in between too. Yeah. yeah. Know, yeah. So the frequent fly points would be in, in a very healthy state right now for Michael. Well, it was funny because I was actually. Um, when I when I saw that you know on Instagram that he was he was heading home, I sent him I I sent him a message. I said have a safe flight, and I I probably traded you know eight or ten messages with him on the flight home, he, you know, on the flight from Perth back to Melbourne. I, I you know so it's just 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 a really cool guy that just has you know time for time for absolutely everybody, and it's it it's an admirable trait, and we you know we could use a lot yeah. more people like that. Oh no doubt, so, no doubt. Are you ready to talk about your most memorable game? Yes, that's, I'm ready to that's, go, Craig. That's one of the reasons that why, why we are here. And I figure we're going to talk. Yeah, you, you jotted down two. And I have to be honest with you. I did not look into the second one. And I will mention the second one was uh, the 2012 uh, Western Region Football League Grand Final between Spotswood and Al- Al- is it Altoona or Altona? Altona. Altona. I live in Altona okay. myself, yeah. Okay. And uh, – and Spotswood was a hot favorite, and Altona held on in the last quarter to win by a single point. I didn't. I just. Yep. I'm reading what you jotted down, but I've done yep. a little bit of uh, um, watching a video and and uh, and such. And we're going to go back to the 1990 VFA Grand Final, and the VFA yep. is now the present day VFL, correct? VFL. Because yes. once the, once yep. the VFL, once the league, once the comp became the national comp, and went from VFL yep. to AFL. 
the VFA transitioned into the VFL, which kind of became like the, the secondary league right directly under the AFL. What happened, what happened is in the late 80s, 1989 was the last year of the VFL, mm -hmm. which is now the AFL. When 1990 came around, the AFL um, had a reserves competition, which was called the Victorian State Football League. And the VFA was still an independent football association without any AFL influence. But um, a lot of clubs, older clubs in the VFA were sort of um, virtually broke. So what they did is they merged the VFA competition with the old VFL reserves or VSFL reserves. And um, in 1995, the VFL was created. So the VFA competition finished up at the end of 1994. Okay. Okay. And, and so we're talking about the grand final from 1990, which is yep. Springvale and Williamston. And so, uh, yep. this was one heck of a game. I've watched uh, highlights of it. I, I watched the, the last five minutes of this game. Why is this game so memorable to you? As a 15-year-old kid, I was so lucky to attend this game, and um, I, had a real, I had a soft spot for both teams. So I didn't really worry who won the game because they um, Springvale won it in '87, in 1987, and unfortunately Williamstown lost 88-89 to Coburg. So it was just they were both going through a great era of football at that stage, and. Um, for a side to be sort of six goals down early in the last quarter and, you know, looking like they were down for the count, mm -hmm. um, to come back like that and uh, snatch a two-point victory um, 28 minutes into the last last quarter was just an amazing, amazing game to be uh, attending live. Surreal. It was just so surreal. Um, was this really happening and all that? And... Um, I still, I still call it the best game I've attended. It doesn't matter if it's local, state, league, or AFL. Mm -hmm. It's the best game I've attended in the sense of what the result was and the comeback and all that. And um, uh, I've watched it many a times in the last 32 years. Like I bought the DVD of the ABC when um, they finally when they went from video to DVD mm -hmm. and um, watched the whole game and. I sponsor a play at the Williamstown Football Club. I've got a soft spot for the Williamstown Football Club in the, the VFL because at one stage they also had were aligned to the Western Bulldogs, which is my AFL team, and that used to be the reserve side in the VFL competition. If you didn't play for the Western Bulldogs in the AFL, you'd get sent back to Williamstown in the VFL, just like what happens these days with Melbourne footballers going back to the Casey Demons now. The Casey Demons are the old Springvale Football Club. The Springvale Football Club okay. um, used, to be, used to be the Scorpions. They were based in Newcomb Road, Springvale. Um, the facilities were a little bit run down. So the city of Greater De uh, city of Casey built a, a big sports complex out at Casey Fields. It's in the middle of nowhere. And um, uh, in the middle of winter, it's ice cold. You probably wouldn't even send your mother-in-law there unless you were a mad um, Casey Demon supporter. Um, my my mother-in-law lives on my mother -in -law lives on a beach uh, on the coast of Western Mexico. I don't think she would go there either. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. And um, yeah, they were rebranded um, from Springvale Scorpions to Casey Scorpions. And then a few years ago, they were rebranded Casey Demons. And um, occasionally, they still wear the old Springvale Heritage jump. But um, yeah, it's a little bit sad that their history has gone a little bit astray where Williamstown went the other way. They mm -hmm. broke away from an AFL alignment and went standalone. And they're still the Williamstown Seagulls. And they still play at Morris Street in Williamstown. But... That game was just incredible for a 15-year-old kid to watch. Like, it, I remember the people around me, the old people. Um, I was sitting next to a former Richmond, Sydney Swans and Dandenong player, Gary Frangales, and I just looked at him and when it got within 10 points, I go, I reckon Williamstown's going to win this. And um, sure enough, they they ran over the top of um, Springwell and won by two points. So, well, it's, um, I, I'm looking at the scoreboard here of the game, and, and at the end of the first quarter... Williamstown was up five goals, four to two goals, five. They were up by 17 points. And yep. then at the half, they were down by 19. So the, uh, they had, they had a collapse in the, in the, yep. in the second quarter. I mean, they, they got outscored by 36 points in the, uh, yep. in the second quarter. Um, and it's, you know, that was what six, I'm looking at six goals. Six, interestingly enough, six goals, six for Springvale 
in the second quarter, which is exactly what uh, which is exactly what Williamstown's going to have in the fourth quarter. The yeah, six goal so six. It's, it's 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 amazing. So it's and and, and it's funny you mentioned you know talking to the, the gentleman sitting next to you because as I'm watching the, the video and I'll put links to these in the show notes. Uh, the uh, I'm watching this and the game got to ninety nine to eighty. And one of the announcers, and I'll be honest, I have no idea who the announcer is, uh, said, and I, I jotted it down here, and I said, when it got to be in, within 19 points, you know, and it was at like the 25-minute mark or something like that, he said, I think Williamstown will get up. And and that then, you know, be, yeah. yeah, go ahead. That was Phil Phil, Phil Cleary, the former Coburg um, coach. He was the, um, he finished coaching Coburg in 88, 89, and Phil Cleary was the man who made that comment. Um, okay. That, and um, he was also a federal politician in the early 90s as well. Uh, but, yeah, his main job was commentator on the ABC. Okay. And is, um, is he related to Mitch Cleary at all? Uh, I have no idea. I bumped into okay. Phil a couple of weeks ago at a Coburg Christmas party. I dropped in and he's still heavily involved with the Coburg Football Club. He still does his... Um, uh, commentary when he gets invited, but um, it's been about eight years since the ABC had the rights to the VFL football. It's now Channel 7's baby, and they generally use former AFL players for their commentary team. Well, it's funny you mention that. I had uh, I had um, a couple of years ago, I had a, a, a lady, and I, and I wish her absolutely the best. I think, yeah, she she was wonderful. She was trying to do this, but she was with uh, um, one of the radio stations in the Gippsland area and she had just moved down from the gold coast here she was a rugby supporter but she was trying to get into the afl and i we were in a, a, in a uh, australian podcast group on facebook and i think it was on just tri- and she was with the triple m station and, and the, she was trying to set it up where i would come on like for three or four minutes each week to kind of preview the round and and i guess that the uh the the producer at the radio station is like we don't want some dumb yank coming on our radio station to talk about our game. Let's go find this former player, and they did. Which I don't, I don't fault them for that. But it, it would have been a great opportunity for the, it would have been great for the podcast. But, but uh, yeah. it's you know, I, I don't fault them for that. I just it was like, gosh, I got, I got to be on there at least one time, um, and then it got shifted up. And it was somebody who, a uh, gentleman who's been involved in a lot of uh, broadcasting stuff as well, and I cannot remember his name, but I, have to, I'll, I'll admit it, he's a hell of a lot better looking than I am. But it was radio. Uh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's, uh, yeah, no, it's um, it is interesting sometimes, um, the way um media outlets go about who they, who they bring on for football coverage and all that sort of mm-hmm. stuff. But um, you know, we can only do what we can only do. Well, it's I, 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 I appreciate, and again, as as somebody who is trying to absorb as much about the game as I possibly can, uh, I, I just I. I appreciate, you know, all the different vantage points from the people, you know, cause I'll, 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 uh, you know, I'll watch all the different, you know, programs that, you know, that, uh, Fox footy put out. Um, I'll watch, you know, when I, when I can find on YouTube, like the, uh, the, the show that Caroline Wilson was on, um, or the front bar, I'll watch those like a day or yep. two later on YouTube. Uh, yep. and I'll, I'll tune into, you know, SEN on occasion, you know, I enjoy listening to and getting the viewpoints for, for from all those different people because because this is this is the game that that interests me. You know, I've yeah. I've been a ba- I've been a baseball I was a baseball fan for well over fifty years. I won't rehash it, but I I've Major League Baseball here in the United States has frustrated the hell out of me. I'm very disappointed with the way the game is going. I am fully on board with with footy, and this this is this is what interests me. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, this is this. So that's why I, it's one of the reasons why I love doing this because it helps me learn about it, and it, it's. I'm hoping to, you know, encourage other Americans to check out the game as well because I think I think it's the greatest game on the planet. I think I think um, Craig, you'll really enjoy a visit to Australia, and if you love your AFL football, you'll start loving football more and more when you actually get to the grassroots level, mm-hmm. like state league level or even local community level, like I. I go to a, I go to a few AFL games a year. A few I obviously commentate a few VFL VFLW and AFLW games on the radio station as well. Mm-hmm. But there's nothing better than getting back to the local community clubs or or the state league clubs and um, you know sitting back having a beer with them, having having a sausage or a meat pie with them, and right, right. Just um, talking talking life in general and also you know. Um, 
you know, this year um, being really involved with a local football club in a coaching coaching capacity, you know, sort of seeing the joy what a premiership brings to a local football club like the Auburn Vale Football Club hadn't won a premiership in junior footy for 18 years until mm-hmm. um, this year. And um, we're a small club based in between between two big clubs, the St Albans Football Club and the Deer Park Football Club. And we only had five teams. That's one junior side, a reserve side, a senior side, plus two netball sides. The two netball sides, the junior side and the reserve side, all won the premiership. Unfortunately, the senior football um, side ra- ran out of gas tickets in the finals, but um, still made it to a preliminary final. What's, okay. the, what's that done for our recruiting? Uh, well, our recruiting, we've gone from one junior side to at least four junior sides this now uh, for 2023. Mm-hmm. And our netball side will probably, teams will probably double from two to four. So, um, you know, that's the sort of joy you get when you go to a community level club. And football clubs and netball clubs are generally together at community level. Yeah, it's, and, you know, and I, you know, I, I have to admit, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump back to the, to the, the Williamstown game here real quickly. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with you. It, it's, and I, you know, actually, before I do that, I, you know, from what I've learned, and I've spoken to a few people who are involved in local clubs and, it, yep. and in, in some of them that are in like small communities, you know, yes, you're, yep. you're in kind of a suburb of, yep. of Melbourne, but I have spoken to some that are, you know, that, that the club, it's kind of, it's kind of the hub around yep. which the wheel of that community turns. Yep. And, you know, and it, and yep. that club is, and, and if you're listening to the States, that club is not just footy. As you said, it's netball. I, I, I saw one recently that it was, it was football it was netball it was soccer it was basketball it was darts they had a darts yeah. team yeah. you know which yep. uh <clears throat> which i guess you know and not any of the other teams don't want to tick off the darts team because they could keep them from being able to practice or playing with a few well-placed darts uh well there's also if you ever get an opportunity to interview one of the ladies at the darabin falcons vflw site ask them about their eight ball club now what is eight ball snooker Okay, I will. Well, I may, ha- I may have to have you give me some contact information for them because I mean, I'm always looking for for people to talk to about the game. But okay, I'll, you know, I'll see what I can do for you. Cool. You know, jumping back to uh, to the to the game that, that we were talking about. Yep. You know, it was it was amazing to watch the 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 closing out of this because again, you know, they're they're coming back. They're down 28 going into the fourth quarter, and you know, you had somebody who who you know. Got him within two points. It was a kick from at least sixty meters out, and I can't remember his. I can't not remember his name, but just a very, very. His legs look like tree trunks. I know that. Um, that, that person was Billy Swan, who is the father of the former Collingwood player Dane Swan. Oh well, he's the one that kicked the game winner, also. Then. Yep. Yeah. Number so he thirteen. Kicked, so he kicked yep. both of those then, because he'd only put. Uh, Rickman kicked the goal that got him within two points. Okay, and that's yeah, that's Billy, the one. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Billy Swan. Billy right. Swan kicked the winning goals. Yeah, Billy's the um, father of Dane Swan, and okay. Ian Rickman still heavily involved with the Williams Sound Football okay. Club. So, because if I'm not mistaken, I, I see on social media that Dane Swan does a lot of different promotional stuff with uh, Ricky Nixon. I yeah, see he on, does. Yeah, he does. I, I do he's, see that they go around. A... They'll go around to different local clubs to help to promote the local game again. Which, which again, you don't have. You don't have. The AFL, or even you know to an extent, you know the Sandful, the Waffle, you know the, the the Northern Territories League, the Queen, you know the QAFL. You don't have those if you don't have strong local clubs that are able to, yeah. that are able to develop talented players to, to to move up the ranks. You need to have those things, yeah. and I, and I, I I think it's wonderful to see you know people who give back to those you know to those organizations you know to help grow to continue the growth of the game to keep the game in place because because it's competing with you know and i hear it's competing with soccer although yep. soccer may let's be honest after this past week in australia in melbourne soccer may be taking a couple <laughs> steps backwards in australia you know yep unfortunately yeah you know, which, you know, which you know you know there may be parents right now that are you know that, that might watch you know the old the old hitting going on in uh in the in the old uh you know vfl video and that sort of thing you know the <laughs> And such going well. Uh, I don't. I don't want you going playing that violent game of soccer. You go back and play footy again. <laughs> yeah. Well, we can only we can only hope that it's um, helped helped Australian rules 
football and other sports. Not that I want soccer to go down, but yeah, it was disappointing what happened um, last weekend here in Melbourne. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, talking about Dane Swan, he he still runs around for St Kilda City in the um, Southern Football League here in Melbourne, and he's also got Aaron Edwards, the former Richmond, North Melbourne, and West Coast player in that team. Okay. James Magna, who played at Melbourne, he plays at St Kilda City. Brendan Favola, ex-Carlton in Brisbane, he's had occasional runs name, yep. at St Kilda City. So I'm well connected with the St Kilda City footy club. So somewhere along the line, I might be able to get you a guest from the St Kilda City footy club um, during 2023. That'd be awesome. Like I said, I'm always looking for connections and, uh, and, and you know, and people who know people. Yeah, I had I it's and I'll I'll I love mentioning this. I, I was able to talk to Barry Cheatley, who played for um the Ruse and then was their marketing director for many, many years. And I spoke to him for like three hours. And when we got done, he he told me, he said, he said, Let me know who you want to talk to next. He said, because if I don't know them and I probably do know them, I know somebody who does know them. Yeah. So it's been, and it's just he's uh, what what an uh, what an absolute delightful man that he was too and I, I and and maybe it's just simply because I've I've you know the people have agreed to come on the podcast but I I have not run across anybody that I've talked to on the podcast where I've thought where I've thought after I got done talking to them wow what a knucklehead I've I've not <laughs> I mean everybody has been has been gracious they've been they've been ge- you know generous with their time you know they're. I, I, and maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's because I'm such a novelty. Because here I am, you know, I'm I'm this American who loves who loves who's fallen in love with your game. I'm not, you know, because there are a lot of you know podcasts that are coming out of Australia about this game, and and they do a great job. I listen to a lot of them. Yeah. But, you know, there there are there are if I rec- if I'm doing the math here, I think there are four of us here in the states that are doing footy related podcasts in different yeah. capacities. You know, um, three of them are are. One of them is not quite as regular as some of the others, but the ones she does are great, great episodes. But there's a gentleman mm-hmm. in the state of Iowa and a couple brothers out in California that, that are doing ones also. So, you know, they're, yeah. we're, we're trying to gain it, you know, gain interest for people here. So, you know, we, we, you know, us footy lovers, especially in the off season, you now we love talking footy. So it's just a case of organizing a time and the time differences and all that. Mm-hmm. And yeah, we're, we're really, um, Happy to talk with you guys over there as well. I appreciate it. So, a couple things, couple things before we wrap up here. Um, and I like to ask questions like this at the end to kind of just help you know yep. learn a little bit about the the, the, the folks uh, that I have on. Um, yep. If you're heading to uh, if you're heading to go watch the Bulldogs play, um, yep. what do you what are you or even I guess at a local game local game what. Are, what are, what are you what are you stopping by and picking up at the concession stand now? I noticed you, you mentioned a couple of the other staples there, but what what else might you be picking up besides the meat pie and maybe the you know the the sausage from the the, the sizzle that sort of thing? You've done a bit of research, haven't you? The chico roll. I have heard of I've heard of that. Yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah. The chico roll always goes down well. I, I I don't see it at many football grounds, but in Darwin, the TIO Stadium. I remember it was about six o'clock in the evening and it was nice and humid and um, I went into the canteen at TIO Stadium and um, there, there it was, mate, the holy holy grail of foods, the Chico Roll. There was 25 Chico Rolls, nothing else to pick from. So I thought to myself, <laughs> yeah, I'll have to be a Chico Roll. Um, drink-wise, Portello. They want, they don't want the Portello drink. It's a... Um, it's a, a a drink that's um, only sold in Victoria. Um, I wish I had a bottle. I could show you what a bottle looks like. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's um, it's a, a unique drink, like um, probably the closest thing to Dr Pepper. Okay. Okay. Yep. Yeah, Got yeah. it. Yeah. Tastes a little bit different than Dr Pepper, but yeah, we we occasionally find Dr Pepper here on the shelves in Australia as well. Um, but yeah, no, sort of just um, occasionally. Yeah, you know, in the sometimes if it's an afternoon game, I probably won't have anything to eat before the game or during the game. I might wait till after the game. But yeah, the Chico roll, the Chico rolls, um, a really good Australian, um, 
role, and it was designed for football games because people. Mm -hmm. It was designed in Bendigo here in Victoria. It's now made in Beth Bathurst, New South Wales, but it was designed by somebody who said it was a lot cleaner to eat than a meat pie because a meat pie can collapse when you eat it if it's overcooked or if it's too yeah. soft. So, okay. Um, but you don't see it in many, many grounds. But um, I've had success in the Western Region Footy League, getting it into a few canteens. So Auburn Vale is one of the football clubs. I I, I walk in at 9.20 on a Sunday morning to coach kids. And let's be honest, the Chico Roll is not a breakfast food, but they already have a couple <laughs> of Chico Rolls ready ready for me. And I, um, then I start moving the whiteboard and the players. And I, I sometimes put down the success to the um, Chico Roll for the game. There you but, go. There you go. So, uh, as you were growing up, now I know I know this was your most memorable game that we that we uh, that we talked about today. But what what players or what couple of players did you idolize when you were growing up? Which were the ones that you that if you had you maybe you had their poster hanging up in your room, that sort of thing. Okay, um, so it's pretty pretty simple um, pretty simple answers there for um, Dougie Hawkins. Being a Bulldogs player, and I know Dougie personally now because um, he's, he's involved with the Braybrook Football Club, and I bumped into him in Darwin a few years ago as well when he was there as a guest speaker. He was a Bulldogs legend um, and captain. Uh, played 350 games of VFL, AFL football for Footscray and Fitzroy. Um, Warry Kappa, and this is Warry Kappa being a Sydney Swans and Brisbane Bears player. It was purely because his mum worked at the same workplace as my dad and where I work now, Monash University. And when Warwick was at, at his peak he, at the Swans, his first first stint at the Swans, um, every time they played in Melbourne, he, he him and his mates would kick a footy at a local park, but they'd let the young kids get involved and have a kick as well. Mm -hmm. And, um, and um, yeah, it, it's... Um, it, I had a lot of respect for that, that he let kids get involved with kicking the footy with his mates and all that. He had a lot of time. Like, people bag Warwick, but he's actually a really nice bloke. He's got a lot of time for young kids and older people as well, especially when he was at his peak in his AFL career. Like, a lot of people just saw the show, man. But once you took the cameras away, he was one of the nicest blokes you could talk to. Okay. It's, it's, that's fantastic. And I... And, and... I just I love hearing you know the stories about the, the the relationship between the you know between the athletes and the the supporters because I think I think there's a genuine love affair between clubs and their supporters and I think it's a mutual yeah. thing yeah it's it's it's, it's yeah, crazy I think I think in the seventies eighties and nineties the the relationship between fans and players I think was a little bit better than what it is now because unfortunately now you've got all these people who hide in the football clubs and if you want to get close to an athlete you know you've got to hire him or something like that mm -hmm. you know you sort of and they're sort of more robotic and you know there's still characters in the game but unfortunately um, they're becoming less and less over the years and that includes male and female football and all that and you know you look at um certain certain establishments or clubs and the administration and you can see why some of their players are so hesitant to be themselves with the public because right, right. they'll probably get a hold over the calls for it well i i i uh last well about uh, about this time last year maybe a little over a year ago i was able to i was able to uh, connect with um, three of the, the young men that the cats drafted yep. and, uh, I got all three of them on for an interview. I just reached out to, I reached out to one, uh, to one of them on Instagram and, yeah. and I, 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 uh, there's somebody who I talk to on, on social media quite often. I, 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 I kind of got quasi admonished for, from the, by them for not having gone through the club to try to set up the interview. And I said, well, now that I know how to, now that I know I have to do that, I will definitely reach out to you to do that then. But, you know, so they said, well, we'll have to talk to the, to the kids about, you know, how they're supposed to go about that as well. So I, I, I kind of, I kind of bent the rules a little bit there for that. One. <laughs> you know, no, uh, Craig, it's no surprise you had to do that. Like um, we have to do that at 3WBC and mm -hmm. as well, like the two clubs we struggled to get on this year, were your club, Geelong, uh -huh. and the Collingwood Football Club. Luckily, I knew the VFL coach at Collingwood. So what I did there is I contacted Craig Black, 
He said, we'd love to get you on. He goes, I'll need to run it past the club. And then we finally got an interview with Geelong. Um, unfortunately, we didn't interview anyone this year, BFLW or BFL, just because they put us through five sets of people and no one would reply to us. So um, it's not that uncommon. That's the same with the Northern Territory Thunder Girls. They were in the VFL competition for two years in 2018 and 2019. And uh-huh. unfortunately, their media department, or this is how it came across, thought they owned the exclusive rights to that team, which makes it hard to promote. Um, yeah, yeah, you would, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You know, but, I, um, my hope is... Rule with of thumb. Doing, my hope Sorry, is with doing, my my hope is with doing the podcast that you know maybe yeah. maybe if I, I'm able to get somebody on that maybe if somebody here in the U.S. you know garners interest in the game maybe they yeah. decide to become a, a supporter of that club become a member of that club. Yeah. You know, well, rule, rule of thumb I have and my co-host have at three WBCs. If if a club doesn't want to come on, that's fair enough. We're happy to promote another, uh, give, give a club another interview uh, spot. Um, if they want to continue to help help and support us as a station, we'll continue and help and promote them. You know, like the Darabin Falcons, they're an independent female football club in the VFL W competition. We've interviewed, them. we sometimes interview them up to three times a year just purely because the major AFL, VFL, W clubs don't mm-hmm. get back to us. So, um, and we're happy to do that because they're yeah. happy to give us a person and a time and all that. It all like we can do as much as we try to do, but um, if if you don't get the love from the other right. end, right, you've just got to find a plan B or C. Yep. Okay. Final question for you, sir. Yes. Um, you have been given the task of organizing your own concert at Marvel Stadium. Okay. <laughs> And you have three acts that are going to be performing there. What three acts are you going to be having perform live at Marvel? Oh, ACDC. You got to go really Australia okay. there. Okay. Um, I'd probably I like Kiss from the old old days, the nineteen seventies. Okay. okay. And um, why not if if Johnny Farnham recovers, um, he keeps on saying one more time, so we'll give him one more time. But maybe Johnny Farnham and Daryl Braithway, James Rain, Aussie Crawl, you know, make it a real Australian sort of um, sort of vibe apart from Kiss. Okay, okay, that works. That works. I I saw Kiss in 1985, yep. so, and, so yeah. and I almost died on the way home from that concert. Uh, <laughs> Almost got into a very serious car accident uh, on the way home, coming home from coming home from Seattle. Uh, yeah. So, hey, uh, I will go ahead and use it here since you told me I can. Laoshi, yep. Laoshi, I want to thank you yep. for uh, for taking time out of your morning on your first day of break. No worries, that's fine. This was a lot of fun. I, I enjoyed sitting down and talking with you. I love love learning about your insight and your passion for the game, and and uh, I appreciate the lesson on how. Uh, you know, Williamstown and uh, and Springvale have you know evolved over over time uh, into the you know, clubs that they happen to be. At this was this was a lot of fun and and a lot of insight yeah. and uh, so glad that you also know Michael as well. Um, but uh, this was great, man. Um, if if you uh, if you're looking to add followers on Twitter, you know I don't know where where might they do that on Twitter if they want to give you a follow there. Uh, at Laoshi, so it's the at logo and L A U S C H I E. Okay. So um, more than happy if you follow me on Twitter, um, you can send me a Facebook request as well at Peter Laosh, um on Facebook. Okay. And um, I don't use Instagram that much, but um, it's at Laoshi there as well. Okay. So um, by all means, um, you can add me there. But um, thank you for the opportunity, Craig. I was. Um, Really nice to talk about um, various types of football, whether it's football in the Northern Territory or the Auburn Vale Football Club in the Western Region Footy League or um, VFA, VFL clubs. Um, I think we had a very solid hour of, of, we did. of, of a variety of football, um, even the Nations Footy Cup. <laughs> and, to, and, <laughs> to be, and, and to be honest with you, I'm running it through my head right now. I am confident 
that we mentioned every single state in Australia during this discussion. We got to, we even talked about Canberra, although we may have done that one off air. We, I don't know if we got to Canberra yeah. on air or not, but we did, Canberra did come up in the conversation. We, we got Canberra on air because we were talking about GWS right, playing right. games. Yes. Um, there, yeah. like Hawthorne and Ta- yep. North Melbourne does in Tasmania. Um, so we, yeah, co- so- we, co- we covered the map. So that yep. I can I consider that a successful episode if we got to talk about every state. Oh, well, it's coast to coast. <laughs> absolutely. North, south, east, west. Absolutely. West. <laughs> absolutely. Well, yeah. hey, Peter, thanks for taking time out, man. I truly appreciate it. This was this was a heck of a lot of fun. No worries, Craig. I, and you, can I um wish you and your family and all the followers of your podcast a uh, happy Christmas and a very safe new year and we look forward to more of your podcasts in 2023 well thank you very much it's 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 greatly appreciated i wish you and your family the best as well and i hope you have a great holiday season um i'm gonna guess you're not getting any snow we're (laughs) yeah i'm I'm looking out the window and the footpath's wet and the sun is out now there you go so there you go we're (laughs) we're uh i'm i'm expecting uh to be doing a lot of shoveling of snow on Friday morning here, so just in time for my 27th wedding anniversary. Yay! I'll be all I'll, right. I'll be there with you in spirit. Well, I appreciate that. I'll, I have an extra shovel for you. <laughs> <laughs> Although both ki- both kids are going to be home, so you know what? I might <laughs> hand both of them a shovel and just say I'm going to have some coffee. I reckon that sounds like that sounds like a plan. Do that. Outstanding. All right. Well, <laughs> hey, Peter. Cheers, sir. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Craig. We'll talk you soon bet. again. You bet. All right, Laoshi, thanks so very much for taking time to chat with me again. Uh, It turned out to be a much more poignant discussion than I think either one of us uh, thought it would be, uh, especially as we're rolling into the the Christmas holiday, and it's it's very very sad, very somber for people who are are Sydney supporters or Footscray supporters, as the case may be, or uh, from Williamstown. Remember that you can find everything related to my podcast over at my website, iyankonthefooty.com. You can subscribe to the podcast there. You can leave a review, which is really helpful. If you want to head over to do, uh, the website there, you can click on a uh, button there, which will take you to Apple Podcasts to allow, to allow you to leave a review. If you enjoy the show, I'd really appreciate that because that helps to trigger that algorithm and uh, hopefully get more people tuning into the show. And that's, of course, what... What I know I want, and hopefully you'd like to share the show with as many people as you know as well. If you want to help support the show, you can click on that Buy Me a Coffee button, that little yellow circle in the bottom left-hand corner. Or if you want to check out some of the podcast gear, you can click on the uh, store page up at the top. I've got stickers, T-shirts, things like that available if you want to do that. And like I said if, many, many times before, if you have a great idea for a guest for the podcast, please consider dropping me a note on one of my socials. Okay? And I would love to hear from you. We are in the holiday season. Christmas is literally right around the corner. You're probably going to be visiting with your friends and family. Tell them you love them. Give them a hug. Let them know that you care. And if there are family members that you can't be with, please reach out to them. Let them know that you love them. Okay? Check in on them, make sure they're okay, and look out for each other. I appreciate the kind words and the support that each and every one of you that have uh, given me have provided. Uh, as you know, in just less than a week, we're coming up on the start of the fourth year of the podcast. And I have to be honest, if somebody said that I'd be going into my fourth year with this, well, I'd be excited. Cause I had no idea where this is going to go. And I can't thank all of you enough who listen to the show. And As always, ladies and gentlemen, may your dribble kick never hit the post. I will catch you later. And this has been episode 217 of A Yank on the Footy. Again, don't forget that you can reach me at yank underscore on Twitter or to yank on the footy at gmail.com. You can find A Yank on the Footy podcast on Facebook, uh, A Yank on the Footy on Instagram. You can find me, Craig Wessels, on uh, Facebook as well if you want to reach out and uh, connect with me there that way. I do check my, my 
personal Facebook probably more often than I uh, than the uh, one associated with the podcast. I probably should get over that one a little bit more, but I do check Twitter quite frequently. Thanks for listening. I do hope you'll consider sharing the podcast with your friends and family. And until next time, ladies and gentlemen, goodbye.